optimize numerical linear algebra. Thank you, Howard. Um, so I'm going to discuss one of the simplest ways to basically create a succinct sketch of a matrix. And that way would be to apply a simple sampling algorithm and pick a few, let's say, rows, but we'll do the same with columns, pick a few rows from the matrix and just keep those rows. So the objective will be take the matrix H, an M by N matrix, and summarize it, summarize it by keeping only a few of its rows to create this smaller R by N matrix. And the sampling algorithm we're going to use is going to be this three-liner here. The input is an M by N matrix A and the sampling parameter R, indicating how many rows of A we're going to keep. And what we're going to do is we're going to fix a probability distribution. We're going to compute a probability distribution over the rows of A, P1 up to P sub M. And we're going to sample in IID trials, independent, identically distributed. That makes our life in analysis much easier. Uh, we're going to sample with replacement, so we could sample the same row multiple times. Again, this is because it makes our analysis much easier. R rows of A, where in each trial, a particular row is picked with probability PI. In order to get unbiased estimators, it's a good idea, whenever you sample a row, to actually keep a rescaling factor as well. So you sample a row, you rescale it as well, and you rescale it by something like 1 over the square root of R times PI. R is the sampling, comp uh, is, is, is the sampling parameter, how many rows you are going to keep. P sub I is the probability with which you sample that particular row. This helps in the analysis to get unbiased estimators. But the idea is you sketch your matrix simply by keeping a few of its rows, and you keep the rows by randomly sampling them. Of course, what I'm not revealing just yet is what are the appropriate sampling probabilities. And that we are going to be discussing throughout the talk. Column sampling would be the same, except instead of doing it on the matrix A, you're going to do it on A transpose. So now if you sample rows of A transpose, you're sampling columns of A. So row and column sampling, they can both be treated within this very simple framework, this prototypical algorithm that I'm going to be discussing throughout the talk. And the question is, what are good choices for sampling probabilities? And about 15 years ago, the proposal that uh, appeared actually in a paper by Alan Fries, Ravikan, and Santos Vembala, and then in another paper the next year that I was also involved in, uh, was to use the so-called length squared sampling. So you're going to sample rows of the matrix with probability proportional to their Euclidean norms, the square actually of their Euclidean norms. The Euclidean norm of a row is the sum of the squares of the entries. So basically you are biasing yourself towards rows of A that have larger entries. If your matrix is a 0, 1 matrix, then you are biasing yourself towards rows of the matrix that have more non-zero entries. And that's a good idea because that's where the action basically happens. OK? So that's a very simple probability distribution, very easy to compute. Just make a pass through your matrix and you are done. And what does it? It has been, of course, explored a lot uh, in the literature over the past 15 years. And it leads to what, in the parlance of this morning's talks, would be additive error approximations. So it's going to lead to approximations for things like the singular value decomposition of a matrix, approximating left, right, singular vectors, singular values, but up to additive errors, which again might or might not be sufficient for your applications. It's going to lead to additive error approximations for things like the CUR and CX factorization. I'll talk about the CX factorization later. It's going to lead to additive error approximation for something that statisticians and machine learners are more interested in in kernel matrices, the Nystrom method and so on and so forth. You want to move beyond. So you want to have better probability distributions that basically get more accuracy when you try to sketch your matrix. One such probability distribution is the leverage course. And Michael Mahoney this morning already mentioned that, but I'm going to go into a lot more detail throughout the talk. And the idea here is the following. Instead of doing length square sampling on the rows of the matrix, you compute your probability distribution looking at the top k left singular vectors of the matrix. So let me explain this with a picture. You still sample from A. You are still going to keep rows of A. That doesn't change. What changes is how you compute your probability distribution. And what you do is you compute the top k left singular vectors of the matrix, and you look at the length squares, at the Euclidean norms squared, of the rows of this m by k matrix u sub k. So that's what you use to compute your probabilities, your sampling probabilities for rows of A. You don't use A directly. You compute the top K left singular vectors 
and you use the rows of UK to compute your probabilities. Remember, the columns of U sub K are pairwise orthogonal and normal. So the columns you know a lot about. The rows, not so much. All you can say is that the Euclidean norms are between 0 and 1. OK? So you use those Euclidean norms squared of the rows of U sub K to form your probability distribution. It looks like there is an extra parameter K here, which you have to take into account. In all the applications of the leverage scores, this parameter K will not basically be a free parameter. It will be directly set by the formulation of the problem. And we'll see a number of applications, so hopefully that's going to become clear. For now, it looks like a free parameter. It's really not. This leads, if you are willing to sample with respect to those much more carefully constructed sampling probabilities, and we'll see how long it takes and so on and so forth to construct them, you're going to get relative error approximations for a bunch of problems for which previously you could only get additive error approximations. So you're going to get relative error approximations to things like, for example, the top K left and right singular vectors of a matrix, actually the subspace spanned by those. You're going to get relative error approximations for CURCX, over and under constrained least squares problems. I'm going to discuss that. You can get relative error approximations to solving over constrained or under constrained least squares problems. Interestingly, you can also look at solving systems of linear equations. The special case of Laplacian matrices, though, we'll get to that as well. And you can get very good approximations there as well by sampling with respect to leverage scores. And of course, I'm talking about raw sampling here. You could do column sampling. And column sampling, same story. Instead of working on A, work on A transpose. Now, the left singular vectors of A transpose are the right singular vectors of A. So if you want to do column sampling, you are basically looking at the top K right singular vectors of A, very often denoted as an N by K matrix V sub K. OK? So two probability distributions. You can do length square sampling directly on the matrix A, or you can compute the top K left singular vectors, let's say, of A, and do length squared sampling looking at that matrix U sub K. And those are the leverage scores. Let's see a few examples that are going to come again and again. One particular example is the case of a tall and thin matrix. This is a matrix that is N by D, with N now considerably larger, let's say, than D. Think that n is at least d log d, and more. Then the SVD, the singular value of the composition of A, can be expressed as follows, u, sigma, v transpose. Let's assume full rank, just to make our life simpler. Everything generalizes. But if you assume full rank, then this is going to be a rotation. Sigma is going to be a diagonal matrix. Um, and the, all the entries there are going to be actually strictly greater than 0. All the singular values are going to be strictly positive. And u, this is the matrix where the action happens. This is going to be the matrix of the left singular vectors, all of them. In this particular case, the parameter k will be d. So we're going to look at the full rank of the matrix. So there is no free parameter k anymore. And the row leverage scores are going to be the Euclidean norms of the, uh, the Euclidean norm squared of the, no, of, the, of the rows of u. OK, so that's the case of a tall, thin matrix. Now you could sample with respect to these row leverage scores and create a sketch of a. That's exactly what we're going to do in the case of over-constrained uh, least squares problems. You could have sort of the symmetric case where A now is D by N, and now you have D again much smaller than N. This is sort of a short and fat matrix. U is now a rotation, assuming full rank. Sigma is a diagonal matrix, all the entries strictly greater than 0. Uh, all the entries in the diagonal strictly greater than 0. V transpose is where the action happens. Now, V transpose, the rows of V transpose are pairwise orthogonal and normal. You don't know much about the columns. And it is exactly those Euclidean norms squared of the columns of V transpose that you want to use as your sampling probabilities. This could be the design matrix in an under-constrained least squares problem, where you now have a small number of constraints, large number of variables. You could use those sampling probabilities, the leverage scores, the column leverage scores, to sample a few columns of A create a sketch of it. And you could use that to solve an under-constrained least squares problem as opposed to the full matrix. Again, no free parameter k. k is going to be set to just d, the rank of the matrix. And of course, the sort of square case, the case where a is an m by n matrix, where now m and n are comparable. In this case, the action happens at a rank k approximation to a. In order to define the leverage scores, you look at a rank k approximation to A, 
this matrix A sub K, which can be expressed from the singular value decomposition as top K left singular vectors, corresponding singular values, top K right singular vectors. So now, basically, you moved from the matrix A to a low rank approximation to A. And in this case, I used the best low rank approximation to A, but you could define, actually, leverage scores with respect to any low rank approximation to A, not necessarily the best one. The SVD returns the rank K approximation that is as close to A as possible with respect to any unitarily invariant norm. But you could use slightly worse. You would still get leverage scores, and actually that's going to be a way to approximate leverage scores downstream. And in this case, you have raw leverage scores. If you look at U sub K, the Euclidean norms of the rows of U sub K, you could have column leverage scores if you look at the Euclidean norms of the columns of the K transpose, and you could subsample rows or columns or potentially, or potentially rows and columns of the matrix to create a sketch. So that's the notion of leverage scores in the three cases that basically cover all possible cases, tall and thin, short and fat, and roughly square matrices. This is not the only way to sketch a matrix, of course. It's a very simple way. You keep a subset of the rows or columns from a matrix. But there are many other ways. As a matter of fact, if you want to keep rows and columns from a matrix, you could use a volume sampling approach, where you are trying to pick a subset of rows and columns from a matrix that span a parallel pipette of large volume. And that's an approach that actually I mean the span that we'll talk about tomorrow. You could use random projections, and that's the stuff that Michael Mahoney was talking about this morning. You can use Gaussians to sketch your matrix, and this is slow. You can use things like the Hadamard transform or Fourier matrix with randomization to get faster sketches. You could use the sparsity stuff, what uh, Michael and Zhang Rimeng and Ken Clarkson and David Woodruff have been developing over the past uh, year to get even better results. There are deterministic ways to pick a subset of rows and columns from a matrix that actually are quite accurate, and I think Nikhil Srivastava will talk a little bit about that in the context of graph specification. Uh, Ido Liberty, who should be talking right after me, will be talking about uh, uh, using streaming type ideas uh, to get very fast, very accurate sketches of a matrix. And of course, you don't have to think about just sampling rows and columns from a matrix. You could just sample elements and get a sketch of a matrix by keeping a few elements from the matrix, not necessarily full rows and columns. And that's something that actually leverage scores even there will help. Hopefully, we'll get to that at the end of the talk. And finally, you could also move beyond matrices. So matrices are basically two-dimensional arrays. There is no reason to just think that this is the end of the story. You could have three, four, etc. dimensional arrays. Those are often called tensors. A lot of things become much harder there. For example, just tensor rank, a natural definition of tensor rank, is MP-hard to compute the tensor rank. Whereas, of course, in matrices, we know very well how to do those things. And Ravi Kanan will be talking about some um, what happens when you move from the matrix land to tensor land. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of applications of the leverage scores. And those are going to be applications to solving over or under constraint least squares problems, doing feature selection in real data, and that's going to be connected to the six factorization, looking at so the solution of systems of linear equations and the special, the very special case where the input matrix is a Laplacian matrix, so it corresponds to a graph. Moving beyond graphs seems to be quite a difficult challenge at this point. And finally, connections between leverage scores and basically element-wise sampling. Before that, let me address two other issues. I'm not going to get too technical in the talk, uh, but I want to show why leverage scores work, what is at the heart of all the proofs that involve leverage scores, and I want to talk a little bit about running time because it's not obvious how long it takes to compute those. You can do it in a naive way via the SVD, but there are much better ways to do it. All the proofs that I know of that use leverage scores at some point use the following argument. Think of now a tall and thin matrix U, but now U is orthogonal. So the columns of U are pairwise orthogonal and normal. In particular, U transpose U is the identity. If you subsample U using the leverage scores, so you keep a few rows of U, instead of keeping an N by D matrix, you move to an R by D matrix. We'll see how large R has to be to create a matrix U tilde. So you keep a few rows of U, you rescale them as well, just like we discussed in the second slide, and you form this matrix U tilde. It turns out that you can prove the following. You can prove that the spectral norm of U transpose U minus U tilde transpose U tilde, so the exact product of U transpose times U, 
versus the approximate product, u tilde transpose times u tilde, is less than or equal to epsilon for any epsilon as long as you sample enough. And sampling enough, think of epsilon being a constant, 1 over 100. Sample enough means order d log d rows. So if you sample enough, you can be compressed to be this matrix u tilde. And now u tilde satisfies this property here, which implies that all the singular values of u tilde are close to 1. So basically, you start with an orthogonal matrix, you downsample, you still have an almost orthogonal matrix. That's basically um, at the heart of any proof that involves leverage scores. This is actually, it used to be a fairly hard result to prove, but recently with uh, the, the enormous project that, uh, progress that has been uh, made on matrix Chernoff and matrix Bernstein bounds, this is basically a very simple application of such bounds. And for those of you who were not here for the boot camp, uh, Michael Mahoney and I, as well as Joel Tropp, gave tutorials. Joel discussed uh, the matrix turn of matrix Bernstein inequalities. We discussed how matrix multiplication implies this kind of result. So take a look there to see the exact connections between these measure concentration results and approximate matrix multiplication. And at the end of the day, this allows us to manipulate the pseudo inverse of u tilde because u tilde is approximately orthogonal. It's pseudo inverse generalization of the inverse to matrices that are not square or matrices that are perhaps singular. Um, the pseudo inverse behaves like the transpose of the matrix. So it makes our life a lot easier downstream. Again, there is a lot of linear algebra that gets into the proofs, but at the very heart, the randomization typically boils down to the fact that this u tilde is approximately orthogonal. The second uh, topic that I'd like to discuss is running time. How long does it take to compute the leverage scores? Obviously, you could just compute the left and right singular vectors of the matrix. So at worst case scenario, it only takes as much time as the singular value of the composition of a matrix, which is something like order m square n or m n square, the mean of the two. It suffices, it turns out, to just compute any basis that spans the same space as the left or right singular vectors. Actually, those bases are not unique. You can rotate them, you still span the same space. So any basis would suffice. This led us to consider, the, to consider the question of, can we get good approximations to the leverage scores? The answer is yes. I'm not going to get into too much detail on those algorithms. They appeared last year. But the bottom line is that uh, by computing approximate basis, and you do that by an approximate QR factorization, you can get 1 plus epsilon relative error approximations to the leverage scores of, say, tall and thin, short and fat matrices. The overall running time to get those approximations is basically order nd over epsilon, where n and d are basically the dimensions of the matrix. Epsilon is the desired accuracy. There are some polylogarithmic factors to consider, which come into play because you can now improve some of these times to order sparsity, using the machinery that Michael Mahoney was talking about this morning. But if you, if you want sparsity, some of the lower order terms come into play, and they actually mess it up. Without sparsity, that's the best result we have right now. In the case of square matrices, so if you are looking to basically approximate the row leverage or column leverage scores of this m by n matrix A, where now m and n are comparable, uh, the direct formulation of the problem just approximate the lengths of the, the Euclidean norms of the uh, rows of uh, the top k left singular vectors is actually ill-posed, the problem being that the k and k plus first singular value of the matrix could be identical. And then you could just put in whichever um, uh, vector you want, either the k plus first one or the kth one. So you're not going to get a unique answer, and that's quite a problem. Uh, you need to look at the relaxation of this problem. And the relaxation would be that instead of approximating the, le the leverage scores with respect to the best rank k approximation, you're going to approximate them with respect to some low rank approximation that is close to the best rank k one. I'm not going to get into too much details. Turns out this is sufficient for applications. Um, this, uh, uh, this ends up uh, in uh, an algorithm whose running time to approximate leverage scores in this general case is order n dk over epsilon. So again, pretty much what you would hope to get. Polylogarithmic factors here. You can take advantage of sparsity, but you will downstream pay penalties uh, when it comes uh, to um, the lower order terms that are hidden in this particular big connotation here. And this appeared in uh, papers with uh, joint work with uh, David Woodruff, Malik Magdon, Ismail at RPI, Michael Mahoney here, ICML and JMLR uh, last year. OK. And for the next 20 minutes, 
I want to discuss applications. How can you use leverage scores in applications? And let me start with the first application, which is going to be on over or under constraint least squares problems. Michael Mahoney actually already discussed some of this, so let me get into some details here for the special case of L2 regression. L2 regression, you are given this design matrix A, over constraint, so you have more constraints than variables. You are looking, you have your target vector B. You are looking for the vector X op that minimizes the error B minus A X op, okay, among all D dimensional vectors. And under constraint, I'm not going to talk much about, but there has been work there as well, very, very similar to the stuff that I'm going to discuss. Uh, Mark Tiger, I think, well, had one of the first write ups in the area, and then uh, in uh, last year's paper in JMLR, we uh, treated the subject in detail again using the more recent advances. Keep in mind that typically here there is no vector x opt such that a x opt is equal to b, so you are looking for the best such vector, and there are, of course, multiple solutions because there is a null space there, and you could add anything you want in the null space, still get an optimal solution. Uh, what you are going to uh, do here is we're going to look for the minimal. L2 non vector X opt among all possible vectors that solve this problem. And that's a problem that has been treated very, very much in numerical linear algebra. We know how to do it. That's a big no no. You can solve the normal equations, but this is not numerically stable. You want to have numerically much more stable methods, and these are exact algorithms. They sort of retain the exact answer. Uh, QR decomposition is more numerically stable, singular value decomposition even more. Complexity order n d square, but constant factors increase as you move from less numerically to more numerically stable approaches. This is the formula for x opt. It's the pseudo inverse of a times b. Pseudo inverse can be easily computed via the singular value decomposition. Um, again, this is the minimal L2 norm vector among all the possible vectors that solve the previous problem. What are we going to do? Well, instead of working with a full matrix A, we're going to down sample A, create a sketch of A, and work with a sketch. Same algorithm I've been talking about. We're going to take the row leverage scores of A. So we're going to take the left singular vectors, approximate the lengths of the norms of the rows of those left singular vectors. But of course, we can do it faster, as I discussed before. So we're going to create the sketch of A, call it A tilde. We're going to keep the corresponding elements of B. So when we sample a row of A, we're going to keep the corresponding element of B. And we're going to solve the smaller problem. So this is the problem we're going to solve. Instead of having the n by d matrix A, we're going to have the r by d matrix A tilde and solve that problem. And it turns out we can prove theorems of this form. We can argue that if you take x tilde opt, the solution of the induced problem, of the smaller problem, and plug it in back to the original problem, so that's your small solution, you go back to your original data, you plug it in, you are not going to beat the best possible, of course. The best possible is the best possible. That's the optimal answer but you're not going to be much worse. You're going to be 1 plus epsilon worse. This is a probabilistic result. It happens with probability, let's say, 90%, and you can drive it down as much as you want by just repeating the algorithm and keeping the best answer. How much, how big is your sketch? Well, your sampling complexity is going to be order d over epsilon and some logarithmic factors. So basically, you need to go, of course, above d. That's the dimensionality of your original problem. So you need to go above D. You need to keep a number of rows that is more than D. Depends on epsilon, the accuracy that you want to get. And downstream, there are going to be some logarithmic factors that you're going to lose. But you solve a smaller problem. You get an answer that is close to the original one. Let me say that we also have bounds for X opt minus X tilde opt. But this is everything follows from that. It's this particular bound that makes everything else work. OK. Good. So that's the first application very much along the lines of what Michael was talking about, except that Michael talked also, discussed also generalizations to LP regression, which become a little bit trickier. Discussed also generalizations, which I find much more interesting, to quintile regression, which is the thing you would want actually to do downstream in practice. And this is the machinery for vanilla L2 least squares regression problems. Let's move on to feature selection and what we call the CX decomposition, CX factorization. The idea is the following. In principal components analysis, what you basically do is the following. You have your matrix A, which now represents, let's say, the rows represent objects. The columns represent features. So you have M objects described with respect to N features. And you approximate that matrix by 
a low rank approximation using the singular value decomposition. So you express it as, let's say, the top k left singular vectors, where k is a parameter that is somehow chosen based on either some statistical knowledge about the data or your own understanding of the data. So you take the top k left singular vectors times some other matrix. I'm going to call it x here. This is the SVD. The advantage of the SVD is optimality. This gives you the best rank k approximation to A among all possible rank k matrices with respect to unitarily invariant norms. So mathematically, this is great. The disadvantage, and let me say that x, we know very well what x is. There are many ways to express it. One particular way is to express s as just the top k left singular vectors transpose times A. It's basically the projection of A on the subspace spanned by the top k left singular vectors. That's what the best rank k approximation is. This is nice mathematically, but in practice, the problem is that you don't know how to interpret the singular vectors. So these are features in your data, the columns in A. The left singular vectors are linear combinations of your features. And linear combinations of things like, let's say you had uh, humans and you are talking about, you know, maybe height, weight, income, and whatnot. A linear combination of those features, it's not obvious what it means. You don't get actual features when you look at the left singular vectors, you get eigenfeatures. You get basically linear combinations of potentially all your features. So in terms of data analytics, one thing we suggested with Michael Mahoney uh, a few years ago now was to replace the left singular vectors by actual colors. Basically, do feature selection. Select a subset of your features, put them in that matrix C, and then once you have that matrix C, solve for a matrix X such that A minus CX is small, so CX should approximate A. Actually, if your target is to approximate the best rank A approximation to A, CX should be behaving pretty similarly to A sub K, the best rank A approximation to A. And here you're going to get actual columns. How many? Well, you want it to be close to K, as close to K as possible. You're not going to be able to do it with exactly K and get a good answer, but with a little bit more than K, you'll get a pretty good answer. And of course, the advantage here is interpretability. Now, instead of having those left singular vectors, which are linear combinations of your data, it's pretty hard to actually say what exactly they mean. You have actual features from your data set, and practitioners have a lot of intuition about the actual features in their data. And perhaps there are much more interesting things to be said here. What is hard? What is easy? Figuring out the optimal matrix X is easy. With respect to unitarily invariant norms, it boils down to least squares. So x, the optimal x, is the pseudo inverse of c times a with respect to unitarily invariant norms. The problem is how to figure out which columns to keep in c. And that's combinatorial optimization. You could look at all possible choices. You don't want to do that. It takes too much time. So what you're going to do is we're going to get better algorithms. This problem has been explored quite a bit in the numerical linear algebra community. It's called the column subset selection problem. You want to select a subset of columns that captures the essence of your matrix. Turns out leverage scores do the trick for you. If you sample, if you just sample columns of A, let's say we sample C columns of A. I'll describe what exactly C is. I'll, I'll, I'll show the formula for C in the next slide. So pick C columns of A, where now the sampling probabilities are basically the column leverage scores for A. There is a parameter K. This parameter is basically um, the, it, it comes from principal components. So this is your target rank. This is what you're trying to approximate A with respect to. So you believe that perhaps the top K principal components is what is capturing the essence of your matrix. So that's your parameter K. You're going to sample columns trying to capture the same subspace. What do you get if you just run this algorithm and sample columns of the matrix, features from your data with respect to their leverage scores? You're going to get A minus CX. Remember, X is just the pseudo inverse of C times A. Basically, you are looking at the projection of A, but on the subspace spanned by the columns of C, as opposed to the top K left singular vectors. You're going to get 1 plus epsilon close to the best possible. So you cannot be the best possible. You're going to get 1 plus epsilon close to that. And the current state of the art, at least in theory, is that for this particular algorithm, with probability 90%, again, that doesn't matter. You can drive this higher if you want. You will need, if you think of epsilon as a constant, you know, getting 1 plus 1 over 100, let's say, close to the best possible, you're going to need order k log k columns from the matrix. And this actually is a lower bound right there if you are applying sampling-based algorithms because of coupon collector problem issues. The running time of the algorithm is dominated by the time to compute the leverage scores. 
And we know that we can do that in order n decay over epsilon time, basically. And for sparse matrices, something a little bit faster for which I'm not showing the exact formula. So that would be the time that it takes to get feature selection, to get the CX factorization up to, to be relative error close to the best ranking approximation. Let me talk just very quickly about one particular application. This application is coming from population genetics. And uh, these are SNP data. If you've never heard about SNPs, uh, they are loci in the human genome where we are known to be polymorphic, but they have a lot of structure. In those loci, you basically are allowed to have only two out of the four possible alleles. For example, in this particular locus, you only have A and G. An individual can be homozygotic in A, homozygotic in G, or heterozygotic, and you can be A, G, or G, A, doesn't matter. We cannot even distinguish between the two. Bottom line, population genetics get you back matrices that are large. They have thousands of rows. Thousands of individuals are included in those matrices. And these days, 2.5 million columns are very common matrices, very common dimensions for the number of SNPs that I get. So thousands of rows, 2.5 million columns. Um, let me show a much smaller matrix, because I want to draw it actually on uh, the slide. This only has 274 samples coming from nine populations, four different continents, about 10,000 SNPs. And again, this is about eight years ago uh, in terms of dimensions. The advantage is I can plot it here. So this is a raster plot. Again, every individual, there are three choices, homozygotic in one allele, homozygotic in the other allele, heterozygotic. So three colors in this raster plot suffice, red, green, and black. And this is what you get. This is what you're going to get. This is what your matrix is going to look like. 274 rows, Africa, Europe, Asia, and Americas. And you are looking at about 10,000 SNPs here. If you run PCA on this matrix, this is what you get. The populations separate. There are much nicer plots than this one that I typically show. But for this example, this suffices. This is a projection on the top three left singular vectors of the matrix. So the left singular vectors are linear combinations of all your SNPs. Linear combinations of SNPs are pretty hard to interpret. Okay? They're linear combinations of loci in the genome. Biologists have no intuition about those. What they want, they want actual loci in the genome, actual SNPs. So we want to find a subset of actual SNPs that basically captures this kind of information in the left singular vectors. You look at the column leverage scores. These are the column leverage scores for this matrix, quite non-uniform. And this is something that we see again and again. I can speak about population genetics matrices, but we see it in other data as well, astronomical data, and so on and so forth. If you look at the top 30 outliers here, the top 30 SNPs, they are not outliers. They're exactly what you want to uh, sample. This is how they look like. You can see there are different patterns formed in the different uh, regions of the world. And actually, we use those uh, as a panel of markers, of genetic markers, that you can use to at least predict ancestry at a continental level. We have a lot of refinements of this in various uh, publications over the years, uh, and some more detailed data that I'm happy to share if you are interested. OK, my next application is going to be on solving systems of linear equations. So I talked about under and over constraint least squares problems. What happens if you look at, roughly speaking, the square case? So if you now look at systems of linear equations and by n matrices, very special case here, the case of a Laplacian matrix. Now, the input matrix is going to correspond to a graph. This is a non-standard way, I guess, or the less, the less standard way to express the Laplacian of a matrix. The Laplacian is an n by n matrix if the graph has n vertices. Assume the graph has m edges, then the Laplacian is the product of those three matrices, B transpose, WB. W, very easy to describe. It's the weights of the edges. It's an n by n matrix of the weights of the edges. I'll assume that all the weights are positive, because I want to be able to take the square root of W. And B is the so-called edge incidence matrix. m rows, n columns. So the number of rows is the number of edges. The number of columns is the number of vertices and two non-zero entries per row, which basically indicate the start and end of each vertex. I'm going to assume undirected graphs here, so it doesn't matter which, which vertex you pick as the start or the end, just arbitrarily pick that. And once you have the edge incidence matrix, and of course you have your weights, you can get L, and because you can take the square root of W, it's very easy to see that, of course, the Laplacian is going to be a symmetric positive definite matrix. Effective resistance is a notion that comes when you Think of graphs as electrical networks. So if you think of a graph as an electrical network, and it's a network of resistors, and the resistance at every edge is basically 1 over the weight of the edge, then the effective resistance between two vertices, the effective resistance of an edge, is going to be the potential difference that you get when you induce a unit of current on one end, you get it out on the other end. So that's a way to think of graphs now as electrical networks. 
This is the notion of the effective resistance. And numerically, the effective resistances are the diagonal entries of this matrix R here. R is an M by M matrix defined with respect to the edge incidence matrix and the weight matrix W. Okay, so it's a formula. This is what you get. There is a pseudo inverse here. The diagonal entries of this matrix are the effective resistances. And the theorem a lemma actually is very simple. It takes only a few lines, lines to prove. Um, we proved it with Michael Mahoney a few years back. The idea is that if you look at this matrix here, the square root of W, diagonal matrix, you just take the square root of the entries, times the edge incidence matrix, that's an M by N matrix. And if you look at the row leverage scores of this matrix here, it's a tall and thin matrix, then you are getting effective resistances. So effective resistances for graphs and the row leverage scores of this matrix here, which you can immediately compute given any graph. You can compute the matrix, not the leverage scores, not the, effect, not the leverage scores. Um, give you uh, the effective resistances of the edges. Why do we care about effective resistances or leverage scores in this particular setting? Because if you take your graph and sparsify it with respect to those leverage scores uh, and effective resistance or effective resistances, you get a sparser Laplacian, a sparser graph, which has very nice similar spectral properties to your original graph. This can be quantified precisely. If you look at solving, I wrote it as a system, as a, as a least squares problem, again, instead of writing it as a uh, system of linear equations, because the Laplacian is rank deficient. Uh, but if you look at these two problems, this is the original Laplacian, any target vector B. This is the sampled Laplacian, so you sparsified and you are looking at only a subset of your edges. And you solve those two problems to get X opt and X tilde opt, you get relative error approximations to X opt. So by looking at this sparser Laplacian, uh, you can get relative error approximations. And that's with respect to the so-called energy norm. That's exactly the setting that uh, the celebrated line of work by Dan Spielman and Sen Juan Teng has been using over the past 10 years now. And of course, there are things that I'm hiding. And this is how fast can I solve the sparse problem. And you want to have basically there a preconditioning chain. And you use Chebyshev preconditioners. That's the good way to do it. The second is how fast can you compute effective resistances or leverage scores, but for the special case where your input matrix corresponds to a graph. The answer to that is that, of course, you can use any of the technology that we have for leverage scores, but that's not the best. The best is this line of work by Yanis Kutis, Gary Miller, and uh, Richard Peng. Fox 2010, Fox 2011, they argued that you can use graph theoretic tools, low stretch spanning these trees in particular, to get relative error approximations to the effective resistances. That's the best we can do. They get that in time that is basically order M, the number of edges in the graph, up to polylogarithmic factors. Our machinery would have an additional end there. So we don't yet know how to make our machinery be extremely efficient in the case where the input matrix is a graph. But of course, the leverage scores are a much more general notion. They work for arbitrary matrices. They don't have to correspond to a graph. Effective resistances and the low stretch spanning tree machinery to approximate effective resistances for the special case of graphs. We'd like to move this machinery beyond Laplacians, move to general matrices. We don't know how to do that yet, and it seems pretty hard. OK, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about element-wise sampling. So I talked about rows and columns. I talked about, I talked about sampling edges from a graph. What if you want to sample a subset of elements from a matrix? Very nice idea, very nice line of work pioneered by Dimitris Chliotas uh, and uh, Frank Maxeri back in 2001 leads to additive error approximations to things like uh, the best rank A approximation to a matrix. Recent breakthroughs by a number of people at uh, Berkeley and Stanford, uh, people like Emmanuel and Ben and uh, Terry Tao and uh, Martin Wainwright, um, who basically demonstrated that from uniform even samples, but under restrictive assumptions on the matrix, you can get exact reconstruction. Here's the framework. So I'm going to talk about actually the framework that appears in these papers and quite a few others. The setup is the following. You are given an M by N matrix A. The rank is rho, and think of rho as a small constant, smaller, much smaller than M and N, basically. Okay? And it's exact rank. You can't tolerate now errors and so on and so forth. It becomes much harder. The SVD is U sigma V transpose. You are sampling elements of A in RIID trials, where now you have a probability distribution over the elements of the matrix. So you are going to sample in RIID trials with replacement, so you could sample the same element twice. Um, and in each trial, you keep an element with probability proportional to this probability pij. Once you have that, you try to find a matrix X that agrees with A on your sample. 
and also minimizes what is called the nuclear or trace norm of the matrix. You'd really like to minimize the rank of the unknown matrix X, which agrees with A on the sample. That's what you'd really like to do. That's non-convex. So you basically settle for the convex relaxation. And the convex relaxation here is the sum of the singular values of X. That's the nuclear or trace norm. If you, if you get PIJ to be just a uniform sampling probability distribution, you need to assume that your original matrix is well behaved. Basically, left and right leverage scores are bounded. That's the assumption you need to make. If you don't want that, and this is work with my student, Abit Sekundo, who actually is here, uh, and also a similar paper, I should say, has uh, come out from the math department at UT Austin very, very recently. If you are willing to do non-uniform sampling to figure out basically which parts of the matrix are more influential for something like the top K left-right singular vectors, then you can get probability distributions of this form here. So this is a probability distribution that if you sample with respect to that, with constant probability, you are going to recover A exactly as long as you sample M plus N times rho square, rho is this rank, and think of it as something relatively small, order M plus N times rho square entries from the matrix. You are sampled non-uniformly. You don't need any assumptions on the coherence or bounded leverage scores for your matrix because, of course, they enter here in the sampling probability. And these are row leverages, the norms of the rows of the left singular vectors, row leverage. This is column leverage. At this point, we need this additional term. And we think this is important. This additional term, which is not row or column leverage, seems to be critical. This previous work does not have it, and they seem to be paying a, highly slight, a slightly higher uh, penalty in terms of the sample complexity, at least to the best of our understanding. Um, this result builds upon a number of ideas. Uh, I want to highlight two. Uh, first of all, we approximate the product of two linear operators using element-wise sampling. Very simple result, but seems to be very powerful in this framework. We heavily build upon this very beautiful paper by Ben Recht a few years ago. And we also use a very recent idea by Dimitris Achliotas uh, and Ido Liberty, um, who basically suggest that you're going to sample elements from a matrix with probability proportional to their absolute values, not necessarily the square of the absolute values. We actually combine the two here in a way that I'm not going to describe in detail. OK, let me wrap up. Leverage scores is a statistic that reveals influential rows, influential counts in your matrix. Can also be used even for element-wise sampling with additional complexities. They're equivalent to effective resistances if you care about uh, graphs and Laplacians. Additional fact, which I did not discuss at all, but you probably um, figured it out from Michael Stock. If you take your matrix and pre-process it by pre- or post-multiplying by random projection type matrices, you're basically going to uniformize the leverage scores, and then you can do uniform sampling. So one way is precondition your matrices by basically using random projection time matrices that washes out the structure in the leverage scores. If you want actual rows, columns, elements of the matrix, you cannot wash it out. You have to compute them, and we know how to do this efficiently. So that's it. Thank you very much. Kind of, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Right, right. I repeat the question. So the, the question is uh, basically what are the, the error guarantees that we are getting are always with respect to norms, and they are perhaps not with respect to the underlying combinatorial objects. For example, do we pick the same columns as the best possible columns in the column subset selection problem? Would be that be a fair way to frame the question? Right. So, so this, is, this is the linear algebraic way, basically, of thinking about these things. So all this line of work started because we want to approximate, say, the left singular vectors or right singular vectors of a matrix. The natural thing to do there is project the matrix on the approximations to those singular vectors and look at how big the residual is. And that's always measured with respect to some matrix norm. Let it be the, the trace norm, the Frobenius norm, the spectral norm. It's, they are not the only norms of interest. There are many other norms that perhaps are of even more interest in practice. The problem is that they are not entirely invariant, so they become much harder to prove things for. I think part of the question which actually becomes very interesting is that, um, for example, in the column subset selection problem, we give no guarantees in terms of the actual columns that we are picking. Are we picking the, a subset or a superset of the actual best columns? That is much harder. 
and we have not explored this at all. So I don't know how to move beyond that. One of the reasons we use these norms is because unitary invariance is great when you do linear algebra. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. So this certainly becomes an issue. Uh, you'd like dependencies that are logarithmic to 1 over epsilon. There are lower bounds that demonstrate, uh, in terms of running times typically, you'd like much better dependencies. In terms of column samples, you're not going to get this kind of dependencies. You're going to have this, you're going to pay this penalty just in terms of sampling. So you will need to oversample if you want to get that close to the best possible. These are worst case theorems. So they work for any input matrix A. So in certain problems, we can get 1 over epsilon. As a matter of fact, if you are looking at the squares of norms, you get 1 over epsilon as opposed to 1 over epsilon squared. So it depends on what is your exact objective. But yeah, I mean, in many problems, we don't know how to move uh, below that. And certainly, let me say again that these are worst case theorems. So in a lot of practical cases, we've seen that k plus a little bit actually works fairly well. So. So, OK, so the question is uh, whether there is any link between this line of work and sparse PCA. So here I'm picking actual columns, just one or two, right? Uh, sorry, a, a small number of actual columns. So another possibility would be to pick a small number of linear combinations of a small number of columns of the matrix. That's basically sparse PCA. And that seems to be, there are two extremes. One is pick actual columns. The other is pick left singular vectors, which are linear combinations of everything. In between is sparse PCA. And I don't know if these results imply anything directly for sparse PCA. I don't think they immediately do. We've thought a little bit about this. But there are other results about sparse PCA that don't go necessarily through this line of work. I think, Peter, you? Correct. So that, that's a nice question. The question is uh, whether the statistical properties of, uh, wh whether it is known whether these sketches have nice statistical properties in terms of, for example, regularizing the original problem, basically. And uh, we have not explored that enough. And Michael Mahoney actually has uh, a couple of papers where he's arguing that um, subsampling with respect to leverage scores, I think joint work with, B, with being you here, where they argue that subsampling with respect to those leverage scores, to a certain extent, can be thought of as regularizing uh, your original problem. But again, I think there are many, many open questions here in terms of the exact behavior of the regularizer there and what exactly it does uh, for your data. So perhaps we should take that one offline and discuss it. But yeah, that's, that's a great point, actually, at the intersection of statistics and computer science. Thank you. Thank you.